Hey everybody, this is a piece by Donald Filzer, who is a, a prominent historian, a uh, labor historian of the Soviet Union. He's written a lot of books on that topic. Um, this is just the an entry uh, from the Cambridge Companion, or I'm not exactly sure what it's called. The Cambridge History of Communism, uh, edited by... Uh, the first volume, at least, is edited by uh, Stephen A. Smith and a someone named Silvio Pons, who I don't know, but Stephen A. Smith uh, edited the uh, Oxford Handbook uh, to the History of Communism, and he wrote the very short introduction to the Russian Revolution um, for Oxford. Uh, he also has uh, lectures on uh, Simon Pirani's uh, YouTube channel, which I highly recommend. I don't think like don't think it's continually. I don't think it still puts up videos, but uh, it's called the uh, Social Histories of Revolution. And uh, Stephen A. Smith talks about um, basically a kind of like a semi uh, autobiographical. Uh, talk about his uh, relationship to um, Soviet scholarship um, from the 1960s onward. Um, he wrote a very important book called um, Red Petrograd, um, which is really important in the history of, in the historiography of um, the Russian Revolution and uh, the Soviet Union. Um, but yeah, uh, Donald Filzer also has a talk on that YouTube channel, uh, Social Histories of Revolution. I believe Stephen A. Smith is even in, even speaks in, uh, speaks on a, a, a video on the Socialist Workers Party UK uh, YouTube channel. Um, I don't know if it's a debate, but it's kind of like a, he speaks, and then uh, Alex Kalinikos speaks. Um, I believe that Alex Kalinikos is definitely more sympathetic to uh, Leninism than Stephen A. Smith, but Stephen A. Smith is definitely a leftist of some kind, and it's uh, I think he's a I think he's a very uh, just based on what I've heard of him speak, he's a very uh, seems like a very trustworthy source and a trustworthy reference point uh, for people who are interested in studying Soviet history. Um, and also him editing the books, you know, I'm sure he has a big hand to play in deciding who uh, the quality, who gets in these, uh, who gets to write for these books. And I'm sure it's a pretty uh, good way to gauge the quality of what's going to be in those books is a, uh, I guess he he's he decides if someone's good enough to write for the books is what I'm trying to say. Um Yeah. Donald Filzer is also on that YouTube channel. And I think he's from the same city that I'm from originally, but uh you have to do that research on your own. I think he's apparently is was teaching at the time of this book being published at the University of East London. Um but enough of my yak. Just wanted to give some context for why I'm reading this and why I think it's important. And hopefully I'm going to learn a lot. And if you're listening to this, so will you. Um, the lecture that he has on, Donald Filzer has on YouTube. I think he has two. I think he has one with um, Wendy Z. Goldman about the Soviet home front during World War II. But he has another, the one that's on the social histories, histories of revolution one is about um, workers' resistance during the first five-year plan in the Soviet Union under Stalin. Um, yeah, so, all right, I'll stop talking now. I'm very lonely, so, you know, you have to deal with me talking to you. And you can't talk back! <laughs> all right, for real, let's go. Um...
The hierarchical class structure of the modern Soviet Union emerged out of the twin processes of forced collectivization and industrialization during the first three Stalinist five-year plans from 1928 to 1941. Industrialization was a time of rapid social mobility. Billions of peasants moved into the working class, and hundreds of thousands of both workers and peasants left the ranks of the toilers to take up post as low-level managers or party officials, from which many advanced still further up the social ladder of power and privilege. Hundreds of thousands more enrolled in the new technical institutions, or excuse me, technical institutes, that trained the new generation of engineers, scientists, economists, technicians, and industrial managers demanded by industrialization. Irrespective of the route they followed, what we see is that people of proletarian or peasant origin left their class and joined the ranks of the tele intelligentsia and party elite. Once there, they adopted a different social role. They managed the society and extracted their privileges from the social product created by the overwhelming mass of the population at the base of the social pyramid who remained peasants and workers. Although the decades after the 1930s still allowed for relatively high levels of social mobility within the pyramid, the shape of the pyramid did not change. By the late 1960s and 1970s, the Soviet Union had a clear discernible inherited class structure. The social group into which you were born was the social group in which you very likely would remain. Um, there's a footnote here to the, uh, the essay in the Oxford Handbook of the History of Communism. Um, Donald Filzer's entry is titled Privilege and Inequality in Communist Society. Um, yeah. I feel like I should also mention that Donald Filzer uh, translated Isaac Illich Rubin's, I believe he translated Isaac Illich Rubin's uh, um, like a, I forget what the hell it's called, The History of Economic Sciences or The uh, History of Political Economy. Um, big book that Pluto put out. I think he also has at least in the past, it wrote pretty extensively on, um, I believe his first name is Evgeny, but I'm not sure, but Priya Brzezinski. Um, and he also has papers that he has contributed to the journal Critique, uh, which is a journal that was at least at one point, I don't know if it still is, headed by Hill, Hillel Tickton, um, who was a, originally a South African Trotskyist who uh, has managed the journal critique since like the early 1970s. Um, and it's basic, a lot of it is includes like uh, critical accounts of um, recent social history in the Soviet Union and Eastern Bloc, starting in like, you know, the, the essay, the journal started uh, becoming available in the 1970s. And different people have things in it. Adam Buick, who's from the Socialist Party of Great Britain, has papers in it. Uh, Maurice Brinton has papers in it. Um, one of I think uh, the the video that I have up here about the exchange of letters between Anton Panikuk and Cornelius Castoriadis came from Critique. So if you like this kind of content, you should check out Critique and see if there's any cool essays that you'd like to read. Um, but yeah, that's just a further thought on Donald Filzu. Industrialization and collectivization had evolved as quite separate policies. In fact, the original variants of the first five-year plan did not foresee, much less incorporate, collectivization as part of their assumptions or calculations. As the policies unfolded, however, they became inextricably linked. In the minds of Stalin and those in the leadership in favor of forcing the pace of industrialization, Collectivization would satisfy a number of aims. Collectivization would rationalize agricultural production, and thus provide a surplus of food for export and to feed the growing number of workers in the towns, whose standard of living would therefore rise. It would also release labor power from the countryside to work in construction and industry. <clears throat> 
When peasant resistance led to widespread destruction of crops, seed, corn, and livestock, these plans collapsed. The agricultural surplus available to finance industrialization disappeared. Although this did not prevent the government from continuing to sell grain abroad in order to buy foreign machinery. And collectivization became a net drain on industrial investment. This left a drastic cut in consumption and an equally sharp increase in the intensity of labor as the main internal resources of accumulation. Um, intensity of labor and sharp decrease in consumption. It's a nice way of saying exploitation, isn't it? Living standards fell and conditions inside the factories and on building sites dramatically worsened. Collectivization did, however, disgorge from the countryside millions of peasants who supplied new labor power for construction, industry, mining, and transport. This new workforce had to be taught skills, but it also had to be tamed, disciplined, and socialized into the rhythms and routines of industrial production within the specific contours of the Stalinist authoritarian system. This proved to be a tumultuous process. Resentment against collectivization and the appalling working and living conditions that workers old and new encountered forced workers to develop a wide range of mechanisms through which they could attenuate these hardships, moving frequently from job to job to search of, in search of better conditions, going absent from work, refusing to be, obey instructions, and most critical of all, asserting partial control over the pace and organization of work itself thereby partly nullifying the regime's ongoing drive to increase the intensity of labor. The early years of industrialization also saw a large number of strikes and mass protests. The regime used force to quell the strikes and protests, but the other symptoms of recalcitrance the regime tried to bring under control largely through economic sanctions, up until the end of rationing in January 1935, by tying good behavior and work performance to the receipt of rations and housing. And after that point, by offering monetary rewards and privileges to those who could break production records. At the end of the 1930s, as accelerating military spending placed renewed downward pressure on the standard of living, labor turnover and absenteeism began to rise. After a vain attempt to curb absenteeism by reasserting the economic sanctions of the early 1930s, in July 1940, the regime made job-changing and absenteeism criminal offenses. These measures granted the regime a partial victory during the war and early post-war years. But once Stalin died, workers again began to usurp considerable control over the labor process. This is to be a major source of instability in the Soviet economy right up until its disintegration during perestroika. Forging a new workforce. The breakneck speed and voluntaristic targets of the industrialization drive led to the mass influx of a totally new wave of workers drawn overwhelmingly from sections of the population, primarily the peasantry, that had little or no prior experience of industrial life. The sheer scale of this transformation can be seen in Table 15.1. Um, this is a um, big uh, chart, but I'll try to get summarize at least part of it. Um, yeah, okay. So... Uh, Yeah, the number of workers in industry increased between 1928 and 1936 by 243%. That means the working class over more than doubled in uh, eight years. Uh, the number of workers jumped from, in 1928, 530, I mean, uh, in 1928 to from 2,531,900 and in 1936, it was 6,173,000. Um, in, in 1928, there was 200, I mean, Jesus Christ, 725,900 female workers. In 
And by 1935, there was 2,321,900. Jesus Christ. My numeracy is terrible. Um, yeah, so the number of women in the workforce jumped by 319%. Um, in 1928, uh, the number of women workers, uh, women made up 28.7% of the working population. By 1935, they made up 41% of the working population. Okay, that's about as much as I can, uh described from this table, but I think those are the leading, uh, the main statistics of most importance. During the eight years from 1928 to 36, the number in, of industrial workers more than doubled. It increased by over one-third during the calendar year of 1930 alone. Jesus Christ. The increase in the number of construction workers was proportionally even larger from around 630,000 in 1928 to just under 2.5 million in 1932, after which the number contracted to 1,740,000 in mid-1935. Jesus Christ. That's like, a, a, like almost a million people subtracted from that, that entire segment section of the economy. As many of the new factories began during, excuse me, begun during the first five-year plan came to completion and the gulag system of labor camps began to take over some of the functions of the civilian construction industry. This figure, this lower figure still represents a near tripling of the construction workers the construction workforce in just seven years. Until 1929 and 1930, many of these new workers had come from the urban unemployed. Others were non-working dependents of urban families enticed into employment by the collapse of the standard of living and the need for a second or even third wage in order to survive. By 1930, however, these sources were exhausted. From then on, the bulk of the new workers came from the countryside, peasants who either fled or were recruited from the newly organized collective farms. The new workers were generally young. By 1933, over 41% of all industrial workers were under the age of 22. They were also increasingly female. Between 1932 and 30, 1935, women accounted for virtually the entire increase in the industrial workforce. By 1939, women constituted 43.9% of industrial workers. Um, that statistic is from Wendy Z. Goldman's Women at the Gates. Gender and Industry in Stalin's Russia, published in 2002. The mass entry of women into industry, and to a lesser extent into mining and construction, had profound immediate and long-term consequences. In the short term, they facilitated the process of accumulation through the hyper-exploitation of industrial labor power. The voracious demand for new workers alongside the collapse in real wages, see below, created both opportunities and compulsion for families to supplement the main, usually male, wage with the labor of wives and teenage dependents. While these extra incomes partially offset the fall in real wages, this also allowed the regime, in the words of one historian, to quote, Realize the output of two workers for the price of one, end quote, thus substantially augmenting the size of the surplus available for investment. Shit, I got my footnotes mixed up. <laughs> 
Uh, that last bit was from Wendy Z. Goldman's. The statistic before is from a Russian source, which I can't read. Um, in the long term, women entered industries where women previously had had only a minor presence. Most notably, coal mining, machine building and metalworking, and iron and steel. Here they made up between 25 and 30 percent of all workers. Yet within these industries, they occupied the least skilled and lowest paid jobs. Footnote. Percentages are from Donald Filzer, Soviet Workers and De-Stalinization, The Consolidation of the Modern System of Soviet Production Relations, 1953-1964. to For marginalization into low-skilled work, see Wendy Z. Goldman, Women at the Gates. At the same time, textiles, garments, and other branches of light industry, where, where women had always been the majority of workers, became even more, quote, feminized, end quote, as skilled men left to take higher paying jobs, often unskilled in heavy industry. There was thus established a pattern that was to characterize Soviet industry for the remainder of the USSR's existence. Women were segregated horizontally into specific low-paid industries within industry as a whole. They were segregated vertically into low-skilled, low-paid, and usually heavy manual work with limited prospects for promotion. Working in Living Conditions and Workers' Responses the rapid increase in the number of workers was largely unplanned. The original five-year plan had anticipated that the increased number of employees, workers as well as clerical staff and industry, and construction would have barely soaked up the pool of urban unemployed by 1933. By 1930, however, the annual plans had been pushed up so high that industry was already suffering from severe labor shortages. Footnote. Eugene Zaleski, Planning for Economic Growth in the Soviet Union, 1918-1932, published in 1972. And R.W. Davies, The End of Mass Unemployment in the USSR. In David Lane, Labor and Employment in the USSR, published in 1985. What type of environment did these workers encounter once they entered the towns? We focus here on three aspects, working conditions, food supply, and housing. Let us look first at working conditions. Lacking adequate resources to fulfill the five-year plans and possibly ambitious targets, the regime tried to compensate through a policy of unrelenting speed-up. At the heart of this policy was the hyper-individualization of labor incentives through the mass application of peace rates. Even in lines of work, for example, equipment repair, where peace rates were not just ineffective but counterproductive. Workers were typically assigned what the Soviets called, quote, norms, end quote. That is, hourly or daily targets for the number of items to be produced. Each item had a job price so that a day's earnings would be determined by the number of pieces multiplied by the job price. By setting the targets high and job prices low, workers were placed under enormous strain to eke out a subsistence wage, just to eke out a subsistence wage. The policy was enforced through the system of shock work. Udarnichestvo. U-D-A-R-N-I-C-H-E-S-T-V-O. Shock workers, Udarniki, were workers, almost all of them young, who were encouraged to exert themselves to the maximum in order to exceed their norms by very large amounts. For this they received not just extra pay, but more important, in a situation of universal shortages, 
privilege allocations of food, housing, footwear, clothing, theater tickets, rest home passes, and places for their children in local kindergartens. On their own, these incentives were not sufficient to encourage ordinary workers to emulate shock workers' records, not the least because outside Moscow and Leningrad, the, quote, privileges, end quote, shock workers received were often meager or non-existent. Footnote. Elena Osakina. Our Daily Bread. Socialist Distribution and the Art of Survival in Stalin's Russia, 1927-1941. Published in nine in excuse me, published in two thousand one. End footnote. What gave the policy its bite was the widespread practice by managers of taking shock workers' production records and then making them the new targets for everyone. Norms were raised and peace rates cut so that workers now had to work considerably harder simply to maintain their previous earnings. The effects of this policy were extraordinarily damaging. First, the system provoked considerable opposition among rank-and-file workers, opposition that occasionally spilled over into physical assaults, some fatal, on shock workers and line, manag line managers. In most instances, these protests were merely verbal, voiced at factory meetings, and usually couched in terms of contrasting the state's industrialization policies with the official propaganda that in a proletarian state, workers should be masters of production, not treated as slaves. Second, speed up in the drive to set records caused inordinate damage to machinery, waste of materials and energy, and a sharp deterioration in product quality as workers cut corners and pushed their equipment to the maximum in order to meet their targets. The deterioration of quality proved a major drain on economic output. Defective items had to be remedied or totally remade. Generally, however, shortages of parts and components compelled managers to use defective products anyway, so that, in the words of one observer, quote, Whole factories are being erected out of defective construction materials and equipped with machines made from defective metal, end quote. Third, of equal or even greater importance in the long term was the systemic disruption that shock work and the push for plan over fulfillment in general caused. Whether in a coal mine, a building site, or a factory, Production required coordination between different interdependent links in the production process. If shock workers fulfilled their targets by 150%, and the other interlinked stages in production were fulfilled only by 100%, then the excess production of the shock workers was of little practical use. The same was true on a more macro scale. If one section of a factory overfulfilled its plan by vast amounts and other sections linked with it did not, here too, the excess output of the record breaking section merely used up raw materials, energy, machinery, and tools to little purpose. Coordination and circulation broke down. This became a systematic feature of the Soviet system until the country's collapse in 1991. In addition to the physical strain, workers were also hungry. In theory, collectivization should have led to an improvement in living standards by increasing the supply of food and rationalizing distribution through the state and cooperative trade networks. The opposite took place, as food production plummeted, while the exodus to the towns meant that by the time of the 1932-33 famine, the number of urban residents needing to purchase food had grown roughly 50%. Footnote. That's from R.W. Davies, Davies, Crisis and Progress in the Soviet Economy, 1931-33. to The increase is from the, the census of 1926 to January 1934, after the famine had abated. End footnote. 
In fact, serious food shortages had started to appear even before collectivization, following the poor harvests of 1927 and 1928, to which those peasants with a marketable surplus had responded by hoarding grain. In the spring of 1928, the regime introduced bread rationing in certain towns in Ukraine and southern Russia, and a more extensive rationing in Leningrad and Moscow in 1929. By early 1930, rationing had been extended to the whole of the country, giving workers basic entitlements to bread, the main staple of the diet, sugar, kerosene, needed for cooking and in some homes also for heating, soap, herrings, pasta products, butter, tea, meats, eggs, textiles, and other essential consumer items. Footnote. Solomon Schwartz, Labor in the Soviet Union, 1950, published in 1952. End footnote. But entitlement to rations did not mean that workers could actually obtain them. For all items, from bread to cotton cloth, were in desperately short supply. Throughout the country, workers could not find meat, fish, milk, or other sources of protein, either for themselves or for their children. Bread shops had long queues, and workers complained that the bread would run out before they had had a chance to buy any. Workers were driven to private trade, where prices skyrocketed. By 1932, prices on private agricultural produce were eight times what they had been in 1928. Jesus Christ, and 12 times their level in 1926. The result was a fall in real wages between 1928 and 1932 of around 50%. In fact, the fall was worse than this. Footnote. That last statistic was from Nam Jasny, the Soviet 1956 Statistical Handbook, a commentary published by Michigan State University Press in 1957. Factories routinely paid wages with great delays. The arrears could be both lengthy and substantial, leaving workers without money to buy food. Money wages were further curtailed as workers were placed under constant pressure to make substantial contributions to state loans. Footnote, Donald Filzer, Workers and Stalinist Industrialization, The Formation of Modern Soviet Production Relations, 1928-1941, to Pluto Press, 1986, and Davies' Crisis and Progress. And footnote. The situation reached crisis point during the 1932-33 to famine, although the vast majority of fatalities were among people living in the countryside, Urban workers suffered greatly, and eyewitnesses reported seeing significant numbers of corpses on city streets. In an attempt to bring consumption into line with vastly reduced food supplies, the government cut urban rations in 1933. In Samara, later renamed Kubishev, K-U-I-B-Y-S-H-E-V, which was in the process of becoming a large industrial center in the middle Volga region, workers in non-priority enterprises had their bread ration cut to just 400 grams a day, enough to provide just 700 calories. Any remaining family members had to share 200 grams between them. Clerical workers were also reduced to just 200 grams of bread a day. Many urban residents, including workers, were purged from the ration list altogether. Davies' Crisis in Progress Equally pressing was the acute shortage of housing. The Soviet Union's urban housing stock (coughs) was already under pressure even before the first five years the five-year plan, excuse me, even before the five-year plans, with factories claiming to be able to provide accommodation for barely 10 to 25% of their workers. 
It was common for workers to share a bunk in a dormitory with one worker coming in to sleep as the former occupant was leaving for the next shift. Once the industrialization drive was underway, the towns, and even more so the large construction projects, proved totally unable to cope with the influx of large numbers of new workers. Enterprises faced multiple problems. The first was the simple lack of space, as new housing construction lagged way behind the rise in demand for living space. From Leningrad to the Earls, factories reported that large contingents of workers were either sleeping in the factory or bedding down at the railway station. Thrud, the trade union newspaper, warned in 1931 that some 4,500 workers at the Stalingrad factory, tractor factory might have nowhere to live during the coming winter. Filzer, Soviet Workers and Stalinist Industrialization, Goldman Women at the Gates. The second problem was the lack of amenities. Housing was not simply housing in the sense that we think of it today. Almost no Soviet cities had centralized sewage systems. In large towns, people used courtyard outhouses, which were emptied of human excrement only irregularly. Barracks and dormitories might have outhouses, but it was common for people to relieve themselves on whatever spare ground they could find. Almost no residential buildings had indoor running water. People took water in buckets and pails from street pumps, only some of which drew water from uncontaminated sources. To wash, a major public health issue in a society where lice infestation and typhus were serious endemic hazards, most people had to rely on public bathhouses, which could nowhere nearly meet demand. The same was true of laundry facilities, which were almost non-existent. Only the very luckiest workers would see their sheets and bedding laundered more frequently than once every two or three months. Finally, there was the problem of the quality of new housing construction, which was simply deplorable. Aside from the lack of essential facilities, barracks and dormitories were cold, poorly lit, with bare, unplastered walls nor were the more permanent residential buildings much better. At the Chelyabinsk tractor factory, apartment buildings put up in 1931 were already in need of major repairs one year later. The, in, the confluence of factors, the mass influx of peasant workers, the policy of sweated labor in the factories, the dire food shortages and the acute shortage of accommodation fit for human habitation made for an explosive situation. One response was strikes and mass protests. These were always spontaneous demonstrations of anger over a range of related issues. Delays in paying wages, cuts in wage rates, norm rises, and the dire shortages of food and essentials such as salt, matches, and kerosene. The scope of strike activity extended from Moscow and Leningrad to the Donbass coal fields, Kharkiv and Odessa in Ukraine, to Gorky, Nizhny Novgorod in central Russia, and further east into the Urals centers of heavy industry. Strike activity persisted from 1929 until at least 1934. Usually the strikes were confined to a single factory or section of a factory, but this was not always the case. The most important outbreak of mass unrest occurred in the Ivanovo industrial region, the heart of the Soviet Union's textile industry, in April 1932. This is a pivotal period. Although still some months away from the catastrophic famine of winter 1932-33, the food situation was already desperate. Protests over food shortages erupted in Leningrad, Nizhny Novgorod, soon to be renamed Gorky, the Urals, Belarus, and the Donbass, where children led demonstrations demanding bread. The Ivanovo region was particularly hard hit because textiles, as a low-priority industry, received lower rations than heavy industry. 
A succession of wage cuts had already made it impossible for workers to buy supplemental food on the open market. And when, on the 1st of April 1932, 400,000 workers saw their bread rations reduced further to just 250 to 350 grams a day, that is, enough to provide between 450 and 650 calories, or barely a third to a half of what an adult needs to fend off starvation, workers struck. Davies, Crisis in Progress. In Tecovo and Vichuga, workers virtually took over the towns for several days and held the authorities at bay. Eventually, the authorities regained the upper hand, suppressed the strikes, and arrested the strike leaders. Jeffrey J. Rossman, Worker Resistance Under Stalin, Class and Revolution on the Shop Floor, published by Harvard University Press in 2005. As dramatic in strikes as strikes and mass protest may have been, the vast majority of workers are left to seek individual solutions to the hardships of industrialization. The most prominent of these was high labor turnover. The first five-year plan had created strong push and pull factors for frequent job changing. The push factors were the collapse of the standard of living, the housing crisis, and the relentless intensification of labor. The pull factor was the labor shortage, which forced industrial managers to compete with one another to attract scarce workers through usually fate, false promises of better housing, wages, and rations. The competition for workers was so fierce that it became common practice for managers to poach workers from neighboring factories. Although labor turnover had been high during the new economic policy, during the first five-year plan, Labor turnover increased by 70% for industry as a whole, and more than doubled in key sectors such as coal mining, iron and steel, machine building, textiles, petroleum, and chemicals. This is shown in Table 15.2. The table gives two measures of turnover. The first is the percentage of an industry's average annual number of workers that quit their jobs during a calendar year. The second translates this into the number of months the average worker remained at her or his job before quitting. Most of the industries listed here the worst year for most of the industries listed here the worst year was 1930. In 1930, a coal miner stayed on the job a mere 4 months, a worker in iron and steel less than 8 months, and workers in machine building 10 months. For managers for managers, this was a real crisis. It made workforce planning difficult, if not impossible, and accentuated the disruptions to production caused by acute shortages of fuel, raw materials, parts, and equipment. It also led to a degra degradation of the workforce's skills which not with knock-on effects on discipline and quality. No sooner had a factory finished training a worker than the worker up and left. For workers, however, the labor shortage gave them at least some limited ability to improve their situation by finding a locality or an enterprise where conditions were less oppressive. One second. That workers were able to exploit their own scarcity shows up not just in labor turnover, but in the frequent violations of internal discipline. The most often cited statistic in this regard is absenteeism. During the first five-year plan, the average number of days per year that workers were absent without leave rose from 4.09 in 1929 to 5.96 in 1931 and 1932. In coal mining during both 1930 and 1931, 
the average mine worker was truant the equivalent of two working weeks. To a significant extent, absenteeism was part of a cat-and-mouse game between workers and management. Labor law stipulated that a worker could be fired from a job only for a third offense of truancy. If managers refused to give workers their release, they would go AWOL for three days to try to force managers to dismiss them. On the 15th of November 1932, the regime imposed harsh penalties on absenteeism. A single case of truancy would lead to immediate dismissal and loss of ration cards in enterprise housing. At a time of impending famine, these were harsh penalties indeed. Absenteeism rates plummeted. Although the real fall was exaggerated by the fact that managers, desperate not to lose scarce workers and in many cases unwilling to cast people out to starve, often surreptitiously and sometimes openly, refused to apply the new law. Footnote. For the details of the law, see Filzer, Soviet Workers and Stalinist Industrialization. On its circumvention, see Goldman. End footnote. The importance of ch job changing, absenteeism, and general insubordination lay not just in the difficulties they created for the enterprise and for the economy as a whole, but in the fact that these were essentially individualized responses by individual workers who had no collective means to influence their situation. The Stalinist state, by making collective action impossible, forced workers to find other ways to counter the hardships they faced. High turnover and absenteeism were one manifestation of this. But a more important and long-lasting one was the attitude that this fostered among workers within the workplace itself, namely in the way they used their work time. The Labor Process, Norm Setting, and Effort Bargaining The turmoil of the initial period of industrialization eventually subsided. Unfinished factories finally came online, living standards gradually improved after the 1932-33 famine. And for a brief period in the mid-1930s, 1934-36, to 36, the leadership attempted to rebalance investment in favor of consumption, infrastructure, and health care. The decline in labor turnover reflected this stabilization. It is precisely here that we see a major shift in the concerns of the economic and labor literature. Away from job changing and overt manifestations of poor discipline toward problems within the work regime itself. Focusing, focus was on two clearly related issues the work, use of work time and norm setting. During the NEP, skilled workers in both machine building and textiles had enjoyed a large amount of control over the work process. They determine the organization and sequence of jobs and, together with work teams that they themselves hired, in textiles, mainly their families and relatives, carried out all operations in the production process, including the maintenance and modification of machinery. By relying on such customary practices, these workers were largely able to defend themselves against attempts to intensify the labor process during the latter part of the new economic policy. This system of work organization was clearly incompatible with the demands of the Stalinist industrialization drive for three basic reasons. First, economists feared, with considerable justification, that the millions of inexperienced peasants taking up jobs in industry would find it difficult to master complex integrated tasks. Second, <clears throat> 
The old system gave workers too much control over the conceptualization and organization of tasks, control which it was necessary to wrest away from operatives and place in the hands of a hierarchical managerial structure. Third, the experience of the new economic policy had shown that this system had made it too easy for the workers to resist the wholesale application of peace rates and the radical individualization of wages and incentives. To this end, industrialization saw work processes become highly specialized. With operations broken down into innumerable small jobs, with each worker carrying out just one specific operation, the wholesale application of piecework was central to this system, as it encouraged each worker to boost individual performance, although, as already noted, this came at considerable cost. By individualizing incentives, workers were pushed to overshoot their targets, with scant regard either for coordination between the different phases of an item's manufacture or for the quality of finished output. I managed to get sick between starting this essay and finishing it. The same logic applied to the different sections and shops within the factory. Shop managers, driven to overfulfill their shop plans, concentrated on parts or products that were easiest to produce, ignoring more costly or complex items that were nevertheless essential to final assembly. The Russians even had a specific name for this phenomenon, Nekomplektnost, which can be translated variably as, quote, incomplete batching, end quote, or, quote, incomplete production, end quote. Of course, one factory's partially assembled machine or defective component became a cause of stoppages in the factory that acquired them. The irregular rhythms of Soviet production provided workers countless opportunities to break up the working day and seize large amounts of time for themselves. Workers frequently had to erupt, interrupt a job to hunt missing parts or tools. They also lost inordinate amounts of time waiting for equipment to be repaired, for a foreman to come and give advice, or for a tool setter to reset or adjust a lathe or a loom. Factory dining rooms almost everywhere had only a fraction of the seating capacity, tableware, or cutlery needed to cope with the actual number of workers. So workers had little choice but to sneak off early to beat the queues and almost invariably returned late. The same was true of the close excuse me, the same was true at the close of shifts. Workers might be housed far away from where they worked, and because public transport was not always coordinated with factory shift times, workers would knock off early to catch the last bus or tram, tram home. The fact that factories compensated for the general shortage of food and consumer goods in state stores by providing these things to their own workers also led to large losses of work time. Commenting on Moscow's Electro Vazad or Electro Zavod in 1937, the industrial newspaper noted, quote, Throughout the day, an unending flow of people spills along the flat factory corridors, through the shops, all along the stairwells. This is the best index of both the level of discipline and the organization of production. In the corridor of Electro Zavod, they trade books and sell ice cream. Sometimes it's a factory, sometimes it's a department store. End quote. All of these would appear as quote objective end quote factors that compelled workers to violate the normal shift regime, but they equally gave workers pretext to steal time for themselves. Time and motion studies found that workers regularly spent long periods of time dawdling at the start of a shift, skiving off for a smoke, wandering around shops walking to work excuse me, wandering around shops talking to workmates, or on night shifts abandoning their machines to catch a bit of extra sleep. 
Not all of these disruptions ease the pressure on workers. Long stoppages due to breakdowns or the non-arrival of, surpri- of supplies had to be made up through massive overtime at the end of the month or end of the quarter, what the Soviets called, quote, storming, end quote. Stoppages could also eat into earnings, a point that was an almost permanent bone of contention between workers and line managers throughout the Soviet period. Yet there is no question that substantial amounts of production were lost because workers were able to exploit the situation to reduce the intensity of labor. The use of work time, therefore, became an area of direct contestation between workers and management, and more importantly, between workers and the regime. The area where this conflict was most intense was norm setting, for it was through the ongoing campaigns to push up norms that the state sought to regain control over the work regime. The apex of this policy was the Stakhanov campaign of 1935-37. to The campaign was named after the Donbass miner, Alexei Stakhanov, who, on the night shift of the 30th to the 31st of August, 1935, mined a, quote, record, end quote, 102 tons of coal in a single shift. Stakhanov's achievement which was not in fact unique or without precedent, had been carefully prepared so that carters, roofers, and other auxiliary workers were on hand to prepare the coal face and load and take away the coal that he hewed, thus freeing Stakhanov himself to concentrate solely on coal cutting. The core idea was was certainly logical. The core idea was certainly logical. A well-organized division of labor within work teams would lead to higher output compared to the traditional system of one miner hewing coal and then collecting and loading that coal. However, once the regime adopted this initiative as the basis of a nationwide campaign to, quote, rationalized, end quote, production, this logical core was soon subverted by two essential factors. First, the so-called Stakhanov movement was used as an extension of shock work. The records of the new Stakhanovites were set as the targets for ordinary workers, who had to cope now with very sharp norm rises, ranging anywhere from 20 to 55%, depending on the industry and the job in question. Second, The rationalization principle became impossible to apply in the context of Soviet industry. Managers could organize the workplace of individual workers so that they could become Stakhanovites. But this came at the expense of taking auxiliary workers, tools, raw materials, components, and other supplies away from ordinary workers who then found themselves unable to perform their own jobs properly. This cut into their earnings and destroyed internal coordination between the different links in the chain of production. In a similar vein, and just as shock work had done, it encouraged the overtaxing and abuse of equipment and created bottlenecks impeding the smooth flow of production. Special, quote, Stakhanovite campaigns, end quote, might register large numbers of participants, but they rarely led to an overall increase in production and not infrequently to just the opposite. Finally, also like shock work, it provoked no small amount of resentment among ordinary workers against Stakhanovite rate busters. This is not to deny that at many factories, Stakhanovism did encourage workers and engineers to devise genuine innovations that rationalized production. But on the whole, the movement subverted its own ostensible goals. It reached its peak in late 1936, and although the title, quote, Stakhanovite, continued to be used until Stalin's death, it carried little meaning. Footnote. Louis H. Siegelbaum, Stakhanovism and the Politics of Productivity in the USSR, 1935-1941, to 
and chapters 2 and 6 of Filtzer, Soviet Workers and Stalinist Industrialization, and chapter 7 of Viktor Kravchenko, I Chose Freedom, The Personal and Political Life of a Soviet Official. End footnote. Although Stakhanov's record was not orchestrated by the national leadership, it came at an opportune time. Over the course of 1934 and 1935, the central leadership had been trying to slow down the pace of new investment in order to introduce financial discipline into the budget and planning processes. This meant that planned increases in output would have to come by increasing the productivity of equipment and the workers using that equipment. The Stakhanov movement appeared as an ideal vehicle for forwarding this aim. Footnote. R. W. Davies and Oleg Klevnyuk. Stakhanovism and the Soviet Economy. Europe Asia Studies, 54, 6, September 2002, blah, blah, blah. However, this necessarily meant a concerted assault on the work practices outlined above, primarily through the imposition of vastly higher norms. Soviet industry worked with two sets of norms. Most were so-called statistical empirical norms, and were calculated to take account of the frequency of stoppages, supply distribution, excuse me, supply disruptions, and the actual pace at which workers did their jobs. Quote, empirical end quote norms, thus reflected the workday as it was actually used. Throughout the 1930s, in fact, during the entire Soviet period, the regime pressed managers to adopt what they called, quote, scientifically based, end quote, norms, derived from the potent output of equipment, or in the case of wholly manual jobs, the potent potential output of the worker. If everything ran perfectly smoothly, with no delays or bottlenecks. Tighter norms and the adoption of quote scientific end quote norms thereby became a weapon for intensifying the work regime and imposing stricter discipline. Footnote Lewis H. Siegelbaum Soviet Norm, Determination in Theory and Practice, Soviet Studies, 1984. End footnote. Over the course of the 1930s, production processes obviously became more streamlined and modernized, but this had little to do with the almost annual upward revisions of output norms. On the contrary, managers were under intense pressure to meet their plans, as the internal factory environment was one of constant uncertainty due to irregular delivery of supplies and frequent but unpredictable equipment failures, managers needed the ongoing cooperation of their workers in order to deal with these problems. Given that the Soviet economy was equally marked by constant labor scarcity and high labor turnover, this gave workers significant opportunities to engage in Western in what Western industrial sociologists term effort bargaining. <coughs> Let me swig my coffee. <sighs> Throughout industry, line managers, through a variety of devices, endeavored to weaken and sometimes totally ignore prescribed norm increases. Where this proved too difficult, they made informal adjustments to earnings through the award of fictitious bonuses, allowing workers to claim inflated output results. The aim in all cases was to allow workers, or at least those upon whom managers were more strategically dependent, to protect customary earnings and regulate the amount of effort they needed to expend in order to achieve these earnings. By the <coughs> By the end of the 1930s, this led to the seemingly paradoxical anomaly where norms were systematically set lower than plans. In other words, if workers fulfilled their norms by only 
the shop or factory plan would be underfulfilled, sometimes substantially. Conversely, where plans were met, norms were overfilled, often by very large amounts. Legal Controls Over Workers' Behavior By 1936, labor turnover, although still high and economically damaging in absolute terms, had fallen dramatically compared to the chaotic days of 1930-32. to 32. It fell still further during 1937 and 1938, but then again began to rise, so that by 1939 the average worker was changing jobs once every 13 months. The increase was especially worrying in the strategically important industries of coal mining, construction, oil extraction, and iron and steel. Alarmingly, the workers who were leaving were not being replaced. More workers were quitting than were being hired. This was largely, although not exclusively, due to a shift of resources into defense production, which had a twofold impact. First, Skilled workers were being transferred out of non-defense enterprises to defense factories. Second, the increase in military spending began to put severe pressure on living standards, which once again began to fall under the recovery, excuse me, fall after the recovery of the mid-1930s. More workers were picking up stakes and looking for better conditions elsewhere. Factories, and the coal mines in particular, found it especially difficult to retain workers recruited, primarily from the collective farms, via organized recruitment, vast numbers of whom quit soon after arriving at their new place of employment. On the 20th of December 1938, the regime introduced the workbook, which recorded the details of the workers' employment history and reasons for discharge. The worker had to present the book when taking up new employment so that prospective employers could, at least in theory, vet any worker they deemed unreliable. On the 28th of December, a much tougher decree placed new restrictions on job changing and absenteeism. It reiterated the November 1932 sanction of immediate dismissal for truancy. A sanction a sanction that in the intervening years had fallen into disuse, but now broadened it to include arriving more than 20 minutes late for work. Insofar as there was a new element, it was to tie the receipt of pensions and sick pay, both administered by the trade unions, to a worker's length of service at the enterprise, a move taken in the hope that this would make workers think twice before changing jobs. Footnote. Decree of the Council of People's Commissars of the USSR, Central Committee of the All-Union Communist Party, Bolsheviks, and the All-Union Central Council of Trade Unions, 28th of December, 1938, on measures concerning the regulation of labor discipline, improvements in the practice of state social insurance, and struggle against abuses in this area, end quote. Pravda, 29th of December, 1938, end footnote. This decree had only limited success. Workers, managers, and timekeepers and factory doctors all found ways to circumvent the sanctions against absenteeism and sick pay. Truants were able to stay at their jobs, and turnover continued to rise throughout 1939 and early 1940 as the military buildup accentuated the labor shortage and placed ever greater downward pressure on workers' consumption. In 1938 laws left the regime with one final option, the outright criminalization of absenteeism and job changing. An edict of the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Soviet of the 26th of June 1940 made absenteeism, 
now redefined to include any loss of work time within a shift of more than 20 minutes, punishable up by up to six months corrective labor at the worker's current enterprise with a cut in pay of up to 25%. This closed the loophole in the law that had allowed workers to commit truancy in order to force managers to dismiss them. Leaving one's job without managerial permission earned a much more severe penalty, two to four months in jail. Footnote. Edict of the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Soviet on the transfer of the eight-hour day and the seven-day work week, and on the prohibition against workers and clerical employees willfully leaving enterprises and institutions. 26th of June, 1940, is Vestia, 27th of June, 1940. As the title implies, the workday was increased from seven to eight hours and the work week from six days to seven, while gross weekly or monthly pay was to stay the same. This meant massive norm increases for peace workers and a freeze on weekly and monthly pay for workers on time rates or salaried employees. End footnote. The new law produced two seemingly paradoxical results. A dizzying number of convictions along spread widespread circumvention. During the first six months of its application, some 321,000 workers and clerical staff were prosecuted for illegally quitting their jobs, and 1.77 million were prosecuted for absenteeism. Yet circumvention and subversion of the law by workers, managers, people's court judges, and local prosecutors were common. It was only when the regime threatened the enforcers, and people's court judges in particular, with repression that the law began to be more strictly applied. Footnote. Peter H. Solomon, Jr., Soviet Criminal Justice Under Stalin, Cambridge University Press, 1997. End footnote. The June 1940 edict, in effect, established a system of indentured labor. Workers were legally tied to their place of work. The move toward indenture was further strengthened in October 1940, when the regime introduced compulsory labor service for teenagers through a new system of state labor reserves. Footnote. Edict of the Presidium of the USSR Supreme Soviet, the 2nd of October, 1940, on the State Labor Reserves of the USSR, Pravda, 3rd of October, 1940. End footnote. This set up a network of vocational training schools. Factory schools for training young teens in so-called mass trades, and trade schools that provided longer training in skilled trades. The schools were to be populated primarily through skill, through labor conscription of collective farm teenagers. The farms were to surrender each year two teenage boys for every 100 collective farm members, the equivalent of 4% of their working age male population. Epilogue The system of indentured labor became greatly intensified during the war. For workers in defense related sectors in the penalty excuse me, for workers in the defense in defense related sectors, the penalties against illegal job changing increased from a few months in jail to several years in a gulag labor camp. The penalties for absenteeism remained unchangeable, but with the added sanction that truants would suffer a drastic cut in their bread rations literally a life-threatening punishment at a time of widespread food shortages and civilian malnutrition. Yet the harshness of the penalties provoked its own counter-reaction. Although nearly one million defense sector workers were officially convicted under the wartime laws, most, quote, labor deserters, end quote, either were never brought to trial or were tried in absentia but never apprehended. Procuracy data suggests that less than 25% of offenders were ever made to serve time. Footnote. Martin Krog, 
Soviet labor law during the Second World War. Um, Martin Kroll actually is a person who has has a blurb uh, of praise on the back of Marcel van der Linden's uh, Western Marxism and the Soviet Union. Anyway, continuing the footnote. Uh, so Martin Kroll's Soviet labor law during the Second World War from the War in History Journal of 2000, November 2011, and Stalinist labor coercion during World War II, an economic approach in Europe-Asia studies. Donald Filzer, reluctant fighters on the labor front, labor mobilization and labor turnover in Soviet industry during World War II. Unpublished conference paper, Association for Slavic, Slavic, East European, and Eurasian Studies Annual Conference, November 2013. End footnote. Labor conscription also reached its apex during the war. As all teenagers and adults not drafted into the army could be forcibly mobilized into industry and construction. The wartime strictures remained in place until 1948. The June 1940 edict was relaxed in the early 1950s and repealed in toto by Khrushchev in 1956. The war and early post-war years also saw the change in the dynamics of informal shop floor bargaining, as workers found themselves far less leeway to attenuate the strains of the work regime. This proved to be only temporary, however, the strain that Stalinist methods of rule placed on the population proved unsustainable. Relaxation began virtually as soon as Stalin's corpse was cold. At this point, the system of informal shop floor bargaining that had emerged during the 1930s quickly reasserted itself. From then until the collapse of the Soviet Union, the authorities never found an effective means to impose tighter controls over norm fulfillment. Wages and, most important of all, the speed and quality with which workers worked. These became a permanent source of instability in the Soviet economy and one of the primary causes of the system's long-term decline and eventual collapse. <clears throat> Footnote. Filzer, Soviet Workers and Destalinization. Donald Filzer, Soviet Workers and the Collapse of Perestroika, The Soviet Labor Process and Gorbachev's Reforms, 1985-1991, to published with Cambridge University Press in 1999, and footnote. Bibliographical Essay Anyone wanting a fuller grasp of the position of workers during the 1920s and 1930s should start with Solomon Schwartz's Labor in the Soviet Union published in 1952. Schwartz was an ex-Menshevik and, and has a teleological interpretation as what he sees as a linear path from free to coerce labor, but the story he tells is empirically rich and offers an excellent introduction to the topic. Three outstanding memoirs of the 1930s are equally rewarding and full of accurate and insightful detail. <coughs> <coughs> Andrew Smith, I Was a Soviet Worker, published by uh, London Ro Robert Hale in 1937, John Scott, Beyond, Behind the Earls, An American Worker in Russia's City of Steel, enlarged edition prepared by Stephen Kotkin, and Viktor Kravchenko, I Chose Freedom, The Personal and Political Life of a Soviet Official. Robert Hale, 1947. The 1980s and 1990s produced a number of re well-researched monographs on Soviet workers during industrialization. Their interpretations differ often considerably, but all are solid studies. Hiroaki Kuramiya, Stalin's Industrial Revolution, Politics and Workers, 1928-1932, published by Cambridge University Press in 1988, focuses mainly on the shock work movement. Louis H. Siegelbaum, Stakhanovism and the Politics of Productivity in the USSR, 1935-1942, Cambridge Uni University Press, 1988, 
examine stakhanovism not just from the point of view of its impact on production, but also its social and cultural role in the context of the mid-1930s. A study of stakhanovism from a radically different perspective is Robert Mayer. The Stakhanov Bewegung, 1935-1938, Der Stachanovismus als Tragendes und Verschärfendes <laughs> Moment der Stalinisierung der Sowjetischen Gesellschaft. <laughs> published by Franz Steiner Verlag, 1990. Donald Filzer, Soviet Workers and Stalinist Industrialization, The Formation of Modern Soviet Production Relations, 1928-1941, published by Pluto, Pluto Press in 1986, is a structural analysis of worker-state relations during the entire span of the first three five-year plans from a Marxist perspective. Vladimir Andrelala, Workers in Stalin's Russia, Industrialization and Social Change in a Planned Economy, published by St. Martin's Press in 1988, advances arguments similar to those of Filzer, but analyzes them within the framework of sociological theory. All of the above books with the partial exception of Meyer, were written before historians had access to the former Soviet archives. Since then, some important specialist studies have appeared. Wendy Z. Goldman, Women at the Gates, Gender and Industry in Stalin's Russia, published by Cambridge University Press in 2002, is a comprehensive study of women workers in the politics of female labor during the first two five-year plans. From 1928 to 19. 37. It also offers a detailed account of the general situation within industry in these years. Stephen Kotkin, Magnetic Mountain, Stalinism as a Civilization, published by University of California Press in 1995, is a monumental study of the building and operation of Magnitogorsk and how workers constructed their lives there. Jeffrey J. Rossman, Workers' Resistance Under Stalin, Class and Revolution on the Shop Floor, is one of the few archive-based studies of worker protests during the first years of industrialization. Sarah Davies, Popular Opinion in Stalin's Russia, Terror, Propaganda, and Dissent, 1934-1941, published by Cambridge University Press in 1997, is one of the only archive-based studies on workers' attitudes, although its representativeness is limited by its focus solely on Leningrad. These and other archive studies greatly enhance our grasp of the nuances and details of the period they cover. They also show that the memoirs and the earlier studies based only on published sources hold up rather well. Thanks for listening.